Thank you. So today our speaker is Melissa Kostick. She's working as a manager to Chicago Region Trees Initiative Operations at the Morton Arboretum. Melissa works with partner institutions to increase canopy cover, reduce the presence of invasive species, and increase the preservation of oak ecosystems in the Chicago region. She has developed several resources and training programs for improving tree selection, planting, and care. Melissa earns a master's degree in plant biology and conservation at Northwestern University. So here is Melissa. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, and I forgot to ask ahead of time, I have two monitors. Do you see the one with the notes or the one with nothing? <laughs> I see the one with the notes right now. I have the left. I didn't get it. I, there you I, go. I, I hit it. All right, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, tonight I'll be talking about climate change and how it interacts with the urban forest, uh, which I'll define in just a moment. But first, I should really give a tiny bit of background on um, the organization I'm representing. So I am from the Morton Arboretum, but I'm representing the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. The Chicago Region Trees Initiative, or CRTI, it's a coalition of organizations working together to improve the health of the urban forest in the Chicago region. So it's a coalition, it's not its own organization, but I, <laughs> the Arboretum, has hired me to work with this coalition. So that's sort of how the Arboretum is tied into this, is they are one of those organizations. Um, and by the way, there are about 14 lead organizations that are sort of guiding the direction of CRTI. But we have more than 200 just regional partners, whether it's municipalities, park districts, commercial tree care companies, uh, nurseries, schools we've planted with, uh, just it's all over the board. Um, a few more things for clarification. When I talk about the seven county region, we're talking about the seven counties around Chicago. So it's McHenry, Lake, Kane, Cook, DuPage, Kendall, and Will. And in these seven counties, there are 284 municipalities um, and there are 50 different wards in Chicago. So it's a pretty broad and diverse and um, mixed use region. I will also keep using the term urban forest and that really just refers to all the trees that are impacted by humans or that humans impact. And so that's really all of them. They work collectively as a forest. In this picture, you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, here is what looks like a forest preserve or natural area. You've also got the backyard trees. You've got the trees along the roads, the ones along the highway, along um, train routes. You've got golf course trees and cemetery trees. They don't know that they're on different properties. You know, these trees are still working together. The birds share the trees. The water goes towards all their roots. Their roots probably intermingle where they can. So really all these trees are one big urban forest, even if we think about the different ownerships of the trees or um, how they um, are part of our own daily walk or something. Um, and the reason I'm even here talking about this, the reason any of you should care about trees, well, urban trees are critical to our quality of life. So anywhere where you have large populations of people, you really need trees because of the services they provide. So this um, colorful and complicated looking chart is really just looking at ecosystem services, which are the functions of natural systems that provide value to humans just by being a healthy functioning ecosystem. Um, and I am not gonna go over this whole thing. It could be an entire lecture or class just talking about ecosystem services, but I will have it in here so that if the slides get shared, you can pause the video or look at the slides later and really dig in. All right, so my plan for tonight is to talk about how climate change is affecting trees, um, and then to talk about how trees can affect climate change, um, and then to end it with a whole bunch of just suggestions for action items, things you guys can do if this has really gotten you charged up. And we'll start with climate change affecting trees. And really, a lot of these slides are just going to be what have we noticed, what, what's already happened and what's modeled to happen um, with climate, and then I'll talk about how those things impact trees. So first of all, um, we use the term climate change. It used to be more commonly referred to as global warming, 
And that's because globally, temperatures are getting hotter. Um, they already have. And these are a lot of different models with different emission rates looking at where temperatures will be across the next several decades. In every model, even the lowest emissions models, the temperature is going up. There are none where it stays level. There are none where it goes down. We know it's going to be warmer. So that's one thing we need to plan on. And again, these are averages, and this is globally. If we um, zoom in a little bit more to just our national temperature changes, this I find fascinating because, again, it's global climate change, but on the local level, it's not always so clear. Um, so these are temperature, cha uh, temperature trends. So the rate at which these temperatures are changing in different areas. So where you see dark red, it's getting hot fast. Where you see blue, it's actually cooling a little bit. Um, if you look in Northern Illinois, we're getting warmer. Um, not nearly as fast as some other areas, but we are definitely getting warmer and that's definitely impacting things that are happening. And by the way, this is what has already happened. This is not modeled for the future. This is what we've already been measuring um, and analyzing. If we zoom in again, so that last slide was national, this is looking at the number of days in Chicago that are um, extreme heat days. So we have 2010, which is recorded data, and then we have two models predicting how many extreme heat days we will have um, in 2050 and 2100, which are sort of frequently used mid-century and end of century um, checkpoints, if you will. Um, so in the low emission scenario, again, we're still seeing an increase in the number of extreme heat days. Um, and I, I want to take a step back for a second. I've been talking about averages so far. Average temperatures are increasing. This is something a little bit different because having more um, extreme heat days will increase our average, but it, do, but it means we'll still have we might have just what we consider like an average summer or maybe even a little bit cooler on some days, but we're going to have this punctuation of really hot days. And those number of those really hot days is going to increase. So something that will be a common theme and I'll keep repeating the phrase, we're seeing more extreme weather. Um, so this is one of the examples. Extreme heat is an example of extreme weather that comes with climate change. Um, and I, uh, I, I need to show, just a little bit more because I am talking about trees and I'm a big tree hugger, but ultimately I love trees because it makes it easier to live and it makes a better quality of life. Um, and so this was, uh, again, I keep showing these complicated graphs and I hope you'll go back and, you know, pause on the ones you want to be able to focus in on more. Just know that there is a rate of human mortality that comes with extreme heat days. The more we have, the more people are guaranteed to not survive those extreme days. So the more extreme days we have, the more humans we're losing to these days. So the size of the circle is um, the size of the human mortality. Um, and it's sort of looking again at models. If we can keep, if we can lower our emissions enough to reduce the number of extreme heat days we have, we can shrink that bubble. We can save actual lives. And, um, Again, I hope you'll pause this and look at it later, but I, I just, you guys are humanists, so I know that this already means more to you, but these are real people. You know, put a face to these numbers. It's not just shrinking that number. There isn't really a number that is acceptable to lose to a growing number of extreme heat days. It's the sort of thing that we really need to, um, to get a handle on. All right, so going back into the plant world, um, if any of you are gardeners, you're probably familiar with what this is. It's the growing zones. So basically the idea is if you look at the average, uh, the average low temperatures for an area, you can figure out what plants can grow there. And so different regions are assigned a growing zone. Um, and just a little backing up a little bit, for just about every plant, there is a minimum temperature that they can handle. That's their hardiness. So some plants can survive in places where it gets to zero degrees Fahrenheit. Some can live in places where it gets to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Every plant has that lower threshold for what they can tolerate and survive. Most plants don't have an upper bound or not one that is meaningful um, just because it doesn't get to be 150 degrees in most places. So it doesn't really matter on the upper bound. So this map is showing you the average low temperatures in an area. Um, what's interesting is that 
from 1990 to 2015, the lower boundary of our area actually went up 90 miles. So whereas in 1990, um, Northern Illinois was solidly zone five, we now are sort of a mix of zone five and six, depending on where you live or really your proximity to the lake. Um, so <clears throat> again, this is <laughs> something that's already happened. We're already seeing those lower temperatures rising up. Um, and the reason this is relevant, I have mentioned it, if you're a gardener, you've seen this before, it affects what plants can grow and thrive in your area. So we actually have expanded how many plants can live in our area, except that, as I mentioned, this is based on averages. And so we still have cold snaps and we still have like ice storms. Um, and so the plants, you can't just plant something from Southern Illinois and hope it'll survive because it might not tolerate ice storms and we will still definitely have those. <clears throat> All right, so many of you may have seen um, figures like this before also. This is looking at two different models for where, um, for an approximate uh, representation of what temperatures we'll have mid-century and end of century. And just like a lot of the, the models you see here, there's the low emission scenario, which is that yellowy orange color, and the high emission scenario, which is keeping our emissions as they are, not reducing them at all, and that's in red. Um, so basically, by the end of the century, we're likely to have temperatures that are more similar to current Louisiana or Texas. So we're getting considerably hotter, even for, I'm going to zoom back up again, we've already gotten warmer. By the end of the century, we can expect what you would expect now in Louisiana or Texas. Um, something really fascinating to note here is that our temperatures are getting warmer, we're having longer growing seasons. Um, and so, again, a complicated chart, my apologies. This line is showing um, how early in the season trees are blooming. So by going down, it means that the trees are blooming earlier and earlier um, at, since the early 1900s. What isn't really changing is the, the date of the last spring freeze. So the last time that we have temperatures cold enough to freeze everything. Um, that has not changed significantly since the early 1900s. And so we're having scenarios where trees start to have swollen buds and start to bloom, and then there's still a cold snap, and then we're losing all those. And this is more than just a problem for having, you know, pretty things in your garden or, you know, those magnolias we all look forward to in spring, and then all of the flowers are gone within a week. This also is going to influence a lot of agriculture. Um, if you're, if you enjoy going apple picking in the fall, you don't want all these apple trees to start um, breaking bud in the spring and then losing all that. It also is messing with the timing of other organisms that depend on different cycles. So the trees are responding to the temperature and the availability of moisture, really. So as temperatures are warmer in spring, it's melting the snow. Precipitation comes down as rain rather than snow, so it's available immediately. So trees are waking up, they're blooming. Um, but the birds are responding to light um, cycles, and those aren't changing. So we're seeing a mismatch of when birds are coming down for migration, um, or when pollinators start to be available, and when the trees are available. Um, I am not an animal behavior ecologist, any of this, so um, I, if you have questions about this, I'm not going to be able to give you good answers. I just know that from talking to um, wildlife experts, this is a big concern. All right, so, so far I've been talking largely about temperature and how it's getting warmer um, and how we're getting more extreme heat days, but that doesn't really address moisture. Uh, and that is another thing that's changing and is also going to impact what can grow in our area and how our trees are gonna do. So here's a fun figure that is again, looking at the national scale, but showing you the breakdown. And what I just really love about this is it's hard to talk about climate change on a really broad scale besides saying an increase in the frequency and severity of storms or extreme weather. Those are the things you can count on. But look at the change in soil moisture. Um, some areas are getting wetter, some are getting drier. Some of them are not being impacted all that much in general. What we have seen in Northern Illinois is that we have been getting progressively wetter. And actually, they were able to look at data for the last thousand years, and there's even a growing trend of getting wetter since then. So here's 
that data, those data. Um, this is looking at days of drought um, versus wet weather. And you can see that uh, we're seeing, we, we have been seeing an increase in the number of days um, that are wet each year. And so it's been getting wetter and wetter. And this is looking at trends over time. So yes, last year we had a drought that really just ended last month um, when we got lots of precipitation. But in general, we've been getting wetter. And um, the way that our precipitation has been coming down has changed as well. And I don't have any figures to show it, um, but what it looks like is that the, instead of having lots of days with a little bit of rain, we've been in the last decade or so getting shorter events with lots of rain coming down. So again, extreme weather. We're having more extreme weather events. All right, so I've been talking about temperatures and precipitation, extreme weather. Um, I haven't talked a lot about trees. <laughs> so here's, here's something interesting to know. Urban trees, these are the trees that are in actually heavily built up areas, they are already stressed. I don't care how well you're taking care of it. If you're in an area like this, these trees are stressed out and you can see the many things that are impacting them, whether it's having a small root volume to grow in or power lines going through them, um, people walking on the roots, uh, bugs that are attracted to stressed trees, so it's kind of pushing them down that negative spiral. Um, the heat that comes with being in a really built environment, all these things <clears throat> contribute to the stress of urban trees. So when you bring in all these extreme weather events to urban areas, these trees that are stressed are going to be impacted even more. So it's gonna take a tree that's maybe not doing great and kill it. Or if it's a tree that's actually doing pretty well, maybe you guys have backyards that are just lush and you've been caring for these trees, you've been taking care of any pests or diseases that come, oh, wasn't this happen? Uh, you've been taking great care of your trees, but these extre extreme events can still weaken them and cause stress um, and that'll bring in other things. So as I mentioned, some pests are drawn to trees that are stressed. So if there is a heavy flood followed by a heavy drought like we had last year, that can be the thing that attracts pests to your yard. Um, and so this is one of those places where um, one of the ways that these climate events are impacting trees, especially in urban areas, is where there are areas with low species diversity. There are some trees that are more susceptible to different conditions. And so in this case, these are actually ash trees. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the emerald ash borer, but it came through and it wiped out um, <laughs> millions of trees in the Chicago region. So here's a tree lined street. And this is just a few years later. You can tell it's summer. It almost looks like winter because of all the bare trees. But I mean, look at these green lawns. There's a tree in the background here. Within a couple years, <coughs> all of those trees were wiped out by emerald ash borer. Now that's not necessarily tied to climate change, um, but we're seeing more invasive pests and diseases coming in as a byproduct of climate change. Um, and in addition to that, there are a lot of trees that are susceptible to floods or to drought or to ice storms. And so we're losing large patches of these trees in areas where there's low diversity. So one of the things that we recommend to people when they're planting trees is to plant a wide diversity because there are a lot of things being thrown at the urban forest right now and you want to build your resilience. You want to have an urban forest that has um, opportunities to survive different weather events and conditions in general. Okay. <laughs> I switch gears a little bit. Um, I've been talking a bunch about what we're seeing already and what we're going to see with climate change. Again, the recap, generally warmer, generally wetter, more extreme events, lots of chaos. Um, and all of that is going to stress trees out. So how do trees impact climate change? Well, I feel like, oh, I, I meant to <laughs> change the order of this one. Um, really a lot of the ways that trees impact climate change is with all the benefits they provide. So you remember earlier in the presentation, I mentioned ecosystem services. Um, trees provide a lot of services and it's in planting a lot of trees and planting them strategically that we can reduce the impacts of climate change on our quality of life. 
sorry, I must have it on some kind of timer. Did not mean to do that. Um, you know, I'll go through this one. Doesn't matter. Okay, so the thing most people think about when we talk about how trees can impact climate change is carbon sequestration. Um, so, if you're unfamiliar with how that works, the idea is basically during photosynthesis, you know, trees are absorbing energy from sunlight. They convert it to carbohydrates, and then they basically invest all those carb carbohydrates into growing. So, the carbon is then stored in branches, in leaves, in roots, in all the different tissues. The carbon is basically used to build the tree itself. <laughs> so when we talk about carbon sequestration, it's really just growing a tree. Um, and so what I will say about this is that trees are can be very important for carbon sequestration as long as we're getting the tree to a big size. If you're planting 100 trees and none of them are surviving past five years, you probably actually have put more carbon into the atmosphere just in, you know, driving the tree to where you are and purchasing tools to dig and all the things that go with producing a tree. If you want to sequester carbon in a tree, you have to plant it and make sure that it gets to a big size. You need to nurture it and make sure it gets there. <coughs> and if you're removing a tree, um, if you can salvage that wood and turn it into furniture, you're you're keeping that carbon in the wood. So again, uh, trees for carbon sequestration, it works as long as you're being strategic and you're thinking about sequestering that carbon. What I really consider the ways you can use trees to combat climate change are in reducing the impacts from climate change. So things like stormwater, I already mentioned, our region is getting wetter um, and we're getting wetter with those extreme events. So less little bits of water here and there, more deluges of rain or heavy rain, uh, snow events. So planting trees to reduce stormwater impacts is a pretty great idea. Um, 100, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little bit of a tickle tonight. <clears throat> 100 mature trees can intercept 100,000 gallons of rainwater every year. And just to be clear, when I say intercept, that's the rainwater that falls on the leaves and is just held in place until it's either evaporated off or drips back down. So the idea with rain or, you know, any kind of stormwater is that you want to hold that water in place. When it comes down, you want it to land on the trees, you want it to land in the soil and get absorbed slowly. The way that our gray infrastructure is built, rain often comes down on our roofs or it's kicked down through our gutters and goes straight into the streets or it rides down the streets straight into the sewer system. And it's, it's not a problem anymore, right? It's off of our land, it's not a problem. Except then the sewer systems get filled up really fast, especially if you have more and more of these extreme rain events. And um, that rain, starts backing up into basements. So what seems like it's a solution to get it away from our houses actually comes back up and becomes a more of a problem. Planting trees is one of those ways to capture that rain right where it falls and give it time to um, filter down to the soil. Um, you can plant trees to cool and save energy. So I already mentioned about extreme heat days, but there's also, um, you guys are probably familiar with the idea of urban heat island effect. So places where you have paved surfaces, sidewalks, roads, even buildings, those impermeable surfaces absorb heat all day long and then release it at night. And it increases the temperature of the ground um, in areas that have just a high percentage of impermeable surfaces. So this is a map looking at surface temperature, same time of day on the same day where it is this dark reddish color, it's really hot. Where you see this blue color, it's really cold, cool. Um, this is an interactive map, by the way. The website is at the bottom if you're curious to play with it. This is just a picture of it, but um, you can move this spyglass around to see what the tree canopy cover looks like in these different areas. And just a bit of a spoiler alert, anywhere where it's blue, you're gonna find a lot of trees. And anywhere where it's red, you're gonna find a lot of just built environments. So, um, I believe this is somewhere in the Naperville area. That's what I searched for. And you can see that here where it's blue, where it's nice and cool, was a big patch of trees. Here where it's starting to be red, it's an area with almost no trees. This is one of those impacts of trees that is so easy to see. It's just, um, it's 
objective fact. And you know, if you're going for a walk or a bike ride, you can feel it. On those hot days when you're riding down a sidewalk and you see a patch of trees, it's gonna be so much cooler. You can feel it immediately. I also wanna point out that the difference between these blue areas and these dark red areas, this scale goes from 60 degrees Fahrenheit to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not a small difference in temperature. This is one of those differences that people who live in this area probably experience all kinds of public health issues related to this temperature and they don't even know it. They don't even know that they're not getting the same benefits that people living in these blue areas get. <coughs> all right, so and of course, there's um, dozens of benefits we get from trees and I can't cover them all, but looking at the things that impact people and are related to climate change, clean air is one of them. As temperatures heat up, it exacerbates poor health, uh, sorry, poor air quality. Um, and and increases the amount of um, asthma rates and other pulmonary illnesses that we see. So we want lots of trees because it's cleaning the air. Um, generally, so I feel like I've, I've said it several times now, but it's just true. Um, those increased temperatures and those increase in extreme events is leading to more public health issues. It's becoming in, in multiple categories, we're seeing a lot of problems with human health. And there's a lot of research that shows um, having a view of trees from your window improves your health. Being outside among trees improves your health. Um, so just a handful of takeaways from studies. Um, residents who live in areas with higher densities of trees take fewer antidepressants. So this isn't even just physical health, this is mental health as well. Um, patients who can see trees from their hospital window um, and this actually also includes views of other green spaces, but I'm gonna be a little tree focused here. Um, they recover more quickly. So that's, you know, saving you the medical costs of being in a hospital, but also saving you from having to eat hospital food. Um, and there was one really large study <clears throat> that <coughs> I, I always like to end with when I'm talking about human health. Somewhere on the East Coast, they were studying human mortality rates from pulmonary and vascular diseases. And it was meant to be, I think, a 10-year study or some other long-term study like that. And right in the middle of their study period, em um, yes, Emerald Ash Borer went through and just wiped out the canopy in that city. And when they were looking at the data over that long-term study, they saw a significant spike in mortality after those trees were removed. So having uh, living in a place with lots of trees keeps people alive. <clears throat> um, and just one quick note, I'd already mentioned with carbon sequestration, it really only works if you get your tree to a big size. All those benefits I just listed, you're also going to see way more benefits from a big tree than a small tree. And I think that makes intuitive sense. You know, if, if it's a hot day, you're not going to stand over, stand under this tiny little tree. It's not going to provide a lot of shade. It's not going to cool you down. This one will. In fact, you can see several people are underneath it. It's the bigger trees can be able to um, filter more of the air for air quality. It's gonna have bigger roots and more leaf cover to capture storm water. That same concept is true with neighborhoods that have lots of tree canopy versus neighborhoods that only have a few trees or all only small trees. <clears throat> so when we're looking at how do we combat the impacts of climate change, we can look at the landscape scale and figure out where do we need to invest more trees, get more trees planted, take care of the trees so they get bigger, based on neighborhoods that don't have a lot of canopy cover or that have a lot of other issues. Maybe they already have major urban heat island problems or they already have poor air quality. You can look at it and try to just grow the canopy in those areas strategically. Which sort of leads me to this next step of what can you do? Climate change is happening. Uh, we know that trees can combat some of the issues we get from it, what can we do? Um, well, here's sort of step-by-step -step or a couple of different options. You can prioritize where you want to have your impact. Um, you can advocate for your municipalities or your communities to get more engaged. You can engage your neighbors, your um, HOA, I uh, <laughs> can't think of the right word. You can engage the people around you and get them excited, get them riled up about trees and about climate change. And then the last one is, planting and caring for trees generally. So starting to prioritize. To prioritize, you need to know what you've got. 
So there was actually, we did a study, uh, I think it was about 2015, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, um, <clears throat> they came to the Chicago region to look at how vulnerable urban forests were to climate change. And we worked with 12 different public land managers. We had some forest preserves, we had some park districts, we had some municipalities, and we worked with them to sort of assess what they had and what their vulner vulnerabilities were. Um, and um, it was interesting because one of the things that we really realized is that in every case, you can't start to figure out what your biggest challenges are until you have an inventory of what you've got. Until you can figure out what your situation is, you can't start to check off, do we have low species diversity? Do we have flooding issues in one particular area? You really need to have a good idea of what you've got. <clears throat> and that's why I thought I would show you guys um, some information we have about the Naperville area using our interactive story map. <clears throat> so again, this is an interactive map. Down here at the bottom is um, the address you can visit if you'd like to play with this, chicagorti.org slash priority map. <clears throat> but I'm just going to go through the slides anyway. So up at the top, you'll see all the different variables I'm going to be showing you for this area. And in all cases, I zoomed into generally around Neighborville. So it's hard to see, but this says Neighborville here. And so you can see, you know, there's Wheaton, there's Lombard, there's uh, Darien. So it's sort of that whole area. <clears throat> um, and forgive me if I'm mistaken, I think you guys are based in this region generally. <clears throat> so looking at canopy cover. Um, oh, I lost the key. Well, basically where it's dark green, you have lots of trees. Where it's pale, you have very few trees. So if you want to prioritize planting where there aren't a lot of trees, this map can show you where you have the most trees. This map is looking at surface temperature. If you remember, there's a really stark correlation between where there's trees and how hot the temperature is. So if you wanted to use trees to address where it's already hot, because you're planning ahead for where it's going to get hotter with climate change, um, you can see near Naperville, there are areas that um, are already very hot and could definitely use some trees as a tool to cool them down. <clears throat> Urban flooding is another variable we use to prioritize. <clears throat> Again, the idea is where it's darkest bloom is where there is the highest rate of urban flooding. Um, just a small explanatory comma here. Urban flooding is different than um, like flooding from a river overfilling or from near the lake. This is mostly sewer, sewer shed related. So there are actually quite a few areas in Naperville that see a lot of that urban flooding. And again, would benefit from trees being planted strategically to capture the water that is flooding those great infrastructures. Air quality, for the most part around these west suburbs, the air quality is not too bad. Um, but as you head a little bit further north, that might be an opportunity to plant those trees to filter the air. Vulnerable populations. Uh, this is a standardized metric that we're actually going to be changing as we get new canopy cover data, I think this summer. Um, but it's one that has been regionally recognized for a while. It basically takes into account uh, census blocks where the populations living there are um, have a low income, they have fewer English speakers, and they have high minority populations. Um, and so put together, that represents just people who are already vulnerable. And typically, those are the people who are most impacted by things like climate change. So um, where you see the darker purple color, it means you have a higher percentage of vulnerable populations living in those areas. And again, because you know that they're typically impacted more by things like climate change, you might plant trees strategically in those areas. Um, and if you care about all of those things I just mentioned, we did conveniently put them all together in a filter so that it shows you in these darker colors what might be the place where you can plant a lot of trees to impact all of these things, to reduce the impacts of those things, really. Um, and it looks like gives you a pretty solid idea. Okay, so <laughs> that's all that information about where, where might be a high priority. Um, Maybe what you'd really like to do with the, the power of this group of people getting together is just advocate for the land managers in your area to um, 
to step up to improve what they're doing. So we have a few tools you can share. So maybe you just call your elected official or your public works directors and just say, hey, listen, there's an adaptation workbook <clears throat> that exists out there and you can enter information about the land you're managing and it'll help you with strategies you can do to prepare for climate change. Um, so that's one thing you can share. We also have a managing risk toolkit. Um, looks like the email, sorry, the website address got taken off, but it's chicagorti.org slash reduced costs. Um, it includes a brief video. I think it's under four minutes long. Um, and it provides links to different resources land managers could use. So this one is meant to be shared with the decision makers in your municipality to convince them to invest more in the trees in the community. So whether it's um, paying for care of trees to make sure that they are pruned or that there's a risk assessment done so that those trees last longer, get to a bigger size, provide more benefits. These are things that you can do. You can call your elected officials. You can say, hey, please check out this video. Please check out these resources. You can also check to see how strong your tree preservation ordinances are in town. Again, those, those trees only provide benefits if they're mature. And if there are a lot of people cutting down trees, you're losing canopy as a community. So if your neighbor takes down three trees, that impacts you, even if those are trees on their property. Um, and we have templates that can be adopted by municipalities. Um, again, resources to share. So that's if you want to advocate to the public land managers. If you want to engage your neighbors and get them on board, we have a lot of printed resources that are free. We're happy to share. Um, things that can be as simple as replacing invasive plants in your yard um, with non-harmful plants, um, adding diversity to a, your yard. If you're if you have a, um, an invasive hedge, something like buckthorn across the back of your yard, these are shrubs that can be turned into hedges that also provide you know fall color, spring flowers, attract butterflies, do things like that to make your yard healthier. This is a brochure that's all about just what you can do in your yard to make it healthier in general. Um, so how to use mulch, how to water your trees when it's dry, um, those kinds of things. And then this one is if you have a lot of land, um, here's how you can manage it. But also, this is something nice to share. If there are people concerned about what's happening at the forest preserves, people see the fires and the smoke and get concerned, or they see trees being removed for thinning, this is the kind of thing you can share with your residents, your neighbors, um, to help them explain what's happening and why it's beneficial and why it matters to have these healthy, thriving forests. <clears throat> um, on a more local, uh, mostly residential kind of level, we also have these door hangers that are meant to be a way for people to talk to their neighbors about really basic things. All it covers is how to water your tree and how to mulch your tree. Um, and it's the sort of thing you can leave your phone number at the bottom. It has logos of reliable sources of information, English on one side, Spanish on the other. If you see neighbors whose trees look super dry, they've never been watered ever, or if the mulch is piled up the trunk, you can take this door hanger over to them and say, hey neighbor, it looks like you love your yard. I love these flowers, but hey, this tree needs a little bit of love too. Um, it's a way to start that conversation. So um, always happy to share those as well. <clears throat> and then the last thing, um, and definitely not the least thing, if you want to help reduce impacts of climate change, um, plant and care for trees. So I hadn't showed this before. This is just showing where canopy cover is the highest. Um, dark blue is highest canopy cover. Yellow is almost none. But what we really found out when you break down what's in each of these pixels is that 70% of trees are on private property. So we can spread this message to all the public land managers we want, but we'll still be missing a huge piece of the puzzle. So if any of you have room in your yards to plant trees, that's really where we need to emphasize planting trees and getting this done. Um, so one thing we can do here is just encourage people, if you're going to plant trees, first of all, plant it right, but also pick the right tree for your site. If you have power lines, if you have a small area or a large area, think about how much sunlight you get, how much water you get. Once you know those kinds of things about your site, you can go to the Morton Arboretum's website, mortonarb.org slash tree selector. Um, if any of you are more familiar with our site, 
from a couple years ago. It just got changed last year. And so this is what the new page looks like. You click here where it says more filters. It'll pop out the screen on the side and you can put in all the information about your site and it will generate a list of trees that will grow well in that area. Um, and we do have a physical booklet version of this. So if you prefer that, you can go to our website and just order that booklet as well. But the idea is that, as I mentioned before, having a diverse variety of trees is gonna make our urban forest more resilient to all of the chaos that's coming with climate change, whether it's the extreme weather events or the invasive pests and diseases that are being attracted um, and surviving while thriving because of the changes in weather patterns. Um, we want that diversity. So plant the right tree for your site, something that's gonna thrive without having to be, you know, if it's a tree, if your site gets a lot of water, don't plant a tree that likes a dry site. And that's the sort of thing that this tree selector can help you with. Once you know your site, you can find the tree that will thrive with minimum amount of inputs. So less work for you and a happier tree. If you don't have much of a backyard or you've already filled it, you know, edge to edge with trees, we also do tree plantings around the region. And we're always looking for more volunteers. So at the bottom, again, the website, chicagorti.org slash events. Please do check us out. All of our planting events are in spring or fall, um, but we're, of course, always welcoming volunteers to join us. Um, and if you know of sites that could use trees, maybe there's a school or a library, uh, anything like that, we're also always looking for more sites that need more trees. <clears throat> so please do reach out to us with those. And whether you're planting in your backyard or if you're coming to plant at one of our events, it is so critical that you plant your tree right. I've, I've heard the phrase a bunch of times, you don't, you don't wanna plant your $500 tree in a $5 hole. So you know, spend the extra couple of minutes making sure that your hole is exactly right. You want that hole to be two to three times as wide as the root ball is what we consider this that comes in. You wanna make sure that when you plant the tree, um the root flare where the trunk starts to flare into the roots but that's above ground so see here this is the ground level and you can see that that trunk is flaring at the bottom above the ground you want to put down mulch um one to three inches deep not touching the trunk so put it all the way around and then pull it away from the trunk it should not touch the trunk at all um and then just make sure that you're watering it for the first couple of years the reason you spend so much time digging a perfect hole, making sure the tree is secure, getting that mulch around. What you do in those first couple of years, what we call the establishment phase, um, that really sets the tree up to either thrive and turn into a massive mature tree or to slowly die over 10, 15 years and get replaced. So for all the benefits that I mentioned, you want a big thriving tree, you want a healthy tree. Um, and if we're gonna sequester carbon, right, we want these trees to survive to their maximum mature lifespan. <clears throat> um, and if you are going to plant a bunch of trees or if you just want to keep track of what's in your neighborhood, uh, I did want to share that we have a new app. Um, it's, it does a couple of things. So the main thing is that you can record trees in the app. You can record existing trees so you can go, you know, do a block every day and just record what trees are there, how big they are, notes about their health. Um, add pictures. You can have pictures of yourself by the same tree every year and just see how that tree gets bigger. So maybe you planted a tree um, to celebrate somebody's birthday or to celebrate a wedding or something like that. You can take pictures of that tree every year and watch it grow. You can share areas that are plantable in the app so that people can come through and then say, oh, well, let's get some trees planted there. You can share stories in the app. So uh, really just if this is something that's useful to you, maybe for a community event, maybe personally you just want to take on the inventory of your HOA or your neighborhood. Um, this is a great way to do it. And I'll just show a couple of the perks. Here's an example where we did, we recorded all the trees that we planted at a school planting event. So there's 50 trees, each dot shows you a different species. So it'll be nice that we can track them over time to see how well they're doing. Make sure the trees survive, you know, 100 years, 200 years. I won't be here in 200 years, but I'm assuming CRTI will keep going. Here's a larger scale. This was an HOA that wanted to do an inventory, so they got their trees in there. <clears throat> and what's really nice is that I've already mentioned a few times that if you have a diverse urban forest, it makes you more resilient. 
So if you are looking and in doing an inventory of your whole neighborhood or maybe your favorite park or something, you can then break it down and see, well, what kind of diversity do we have? And then what's interesting is if you notice that all your nori maples die or something in, after a couple of years, you can then look back and see, oh, was there a major flood event? Was there something that triggered this? Maybe this is not a hardy tree for this area. Good way to collect information and track changes. Um, I'm nearing the end here, um, but I did want to make sure that you're all aware also that we have resources out there. If, if there is a tree in your yard that you're concerned about, the Morton Arboretum has a plant clinic that is just phenomenal. You can call them, you can email them, you can visit in person, um, you show them pictures, bring in samples and just say, there's something wrong with my tree, this is what's happening. And they are just incredible at being able to troubleshoot and get answers. And finally, um, if you've already done amazing things in your yard, and you wanna inspire your neighbors, one way to do that is to get a conservation at home sign that talks about how you have rain gardens and native plants and you've cleared out your buckthorn. <clears throat> Just a sign that says conservation at home. You can do this in your workplace too. A lot of people will walk by, they see the sign, and then if you're out you know, watering your tree, they might say, oh, what's this about? And that's how you get that conversation started and say, well, Here's the stuff I've done, and if you do the same, you can get the sign and also improve the health of our whole neighborhood. Bring in more pollinators, bring in more birds, support the birds that are migrating at the wrong time. Um, all that. So I think that's all I've got. It is um, happy to answer any questions, though. That was fantastic. Thank you. So <laughs> rich with information. Um, as I said, a lot of us are, if not all of us, are big fans of science and and I loved all the graphs and maps and everything. That was great. Um, I, I had a quick question. What is this Chicago ORTI? What is, is that associated with the Arboretum? What is that? Um, Chicago RTI, uh, well, it's just the, the website for the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. So we are a coalition, lots of organizations are involved. Um, the Arboretum is just one of the many partners, but they are the founding partner. And so they're the most, uh, the most deeply involved. Uh, they have several people on staff who offer technical assistance to municipalities or provide outreach to um, high priority communities, things like that. Okay. We had a question in the chat. Um, how do we help the fungus that the trees depend upon? Is that something that you, uh, you know about? It is. <clears throat> um, goodness. Um, all right, so I have, so, sorry, my brain is splitting into like five different directions with what to say about this, because it's a really, it's a complicated thing. There's a ton of people studying it. And you are absolutely right, that if we want healthy trees, we need to make sure that the ecosystem that they are a part of is also healthy and thriving. So it's not enough to put a tree in a small dirt square in our you know, downtown areas. We need to make sure that we're thinking about the whole picture and the whole ecosystem. So one thing to do, um, if it's a place where you can put, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what is sometimes referred to as a living mulch or other plants, just perennials, especially native perennials, things like sedges at the base, that'll encourage a whole lot of things to happen, which, you know, one is the, the turnover of the fine roots. As those die, they become food for all kinds of things living in the rhizosphere. So the ecosystem that's in that soil below ground if you can't plant anything in that area, maybe it's a street tree or something, putting down the mulch will encourage um, not just the, the fungus to come in, but also um, healthy bacteria and things like that. So interestingly, the soils in our area tend to be more on um, the alkaline side. And so when you, when you put things down like mulch, it, sort of draws in the things that break down woody materials. Um, so those are a lot of, you know, the bacteria, the fungi, the, um, to some extent, like the nematodes. It brings them in because there's a food source and because there's water there that's being held in place. And then as they release the waste from eating those materials, it also acidifies the soil, which then makes more nutrients available to the tree because they are just able to take up more nutrients in a more neutral soil. So. Yes, <laughs> I think I, I went too far down one of those uh, 
directions in my brain. But the idea is yes, you don't want to just plant a tree, you want to create a healthy ecosystem. So best scenario is put down some mulch, but also plant things in that root zone, just to encourage all that to come. It will come naturally. You don't have to put spores in the soil. It all already exists in the area, like in the region. If you put something down that the fungi can consume, they will come. Um, so plants ideally, some mulch also good. Excellent. Like untreated wood mulch is what I mean, sorry. Excellent. So um, you'd mentioned something in, in your description mm -hmm. there about uh, planting something under the tree. I, I thought that it was pretty, well, my experience, I have 20 some trees in my, on my little, uh, little lot for my house and keeping things alive under the trees has proved difficult. I have a lot of bare soil under there. So, um, you don't necessarily have to answer my personal question, but can I turn to places like the Morton Arboretum to find advice? Uh, how, how do I find advice about what to do with my own garden? Absolutely. So, the plant clinic, let's see, can I still move the slides? I think the Arboretum's plant clinic will be your best source for that. They have so many, uh, they'll provide lists of ground covers that do well under different types of trees. They also just have, you know, um, decades of knowledge with landscaping. <clears throat> um, in a lot of cases, it is just finding trees, sorry, finding the plants that can do well with the right amount of light. If you're planting under a walnut or like a pine tree, you know, you probably have a whole lot more trouble than planting under an oak. Or something like that. So right. it, it might be a bit species specific, but um, the one thing I do want to say that I should probably be more careful about planting something like sedges is different than like planting annuals that you've got to dig up every single year. You do not want to damage the roots of your tree. So if you have to dig there every year to put your plants in, that's not going to be great for the health of the tree. Um, so either you can use seed, like uh, seeds of the plants you're trying to plant so it's not so invasive. Um, or just a one-time planting, or you know, if you're planting a tree, maybe plant them all at the same time so you know where the roots are. Okay. Um, this is Bonnie. I have a question. So, do you, so let's just talk about Chicago region or Illinois specific, specifically. Do you know if during the past fifty years, because of global warming, is there any prairie plants or trees that didn't survive mm -hmm. um, or in the next 50 years when the temperature getting warmer do you know if there will be some kind of local native plants is not going to survive after 50 um, in 50 years that is such a great question um, I don't want to say we will definitely see that but it is likely um, one of the slides that I cut out of here um, was actually showing that it's not just, I was talking a bit about, you know, how temperature and moisture are going to affect what can grow. But even with warmer temperatures, it's not changing the soil type that we have, or, you know, it takes trees a while to move. So people have to, you have to actually physically transplant the plants that you're trying to get from different areas. With that, we will be losing some more ecosystem types. We will be losing some species. Um, whether it's by the end of the century, sooner or later, I, I don't know those kinds of specifics. Um, there are people who are tracking that sort of thing though. Um, yeah, I guess I, I can't say specifically which ones we've already lost, if any. There's not anything coming to mind, but, but it is likely that that will happen. <clears throat> Thank we you. Have we have another question in the chat from uh, Howard. <clears throat> uh, he asks, in the slide showing the Chicago land canopy coverage, is the yellow area where there's no canopy, is, is that agriculture land? You know, as you get further west from the city, there was a lot of that uh, yellow yeah, color. Yeah, um, so I usually spend more time on this slide, but I was afraid I was gonna run out of time. <laughs> It's interesting when you look at the patterns of where you have the most trees, it's pretty heavily forested here in Lake County. But on the edges, like you noted, that is really low canopy cover. Uh, and of course, something happened with um, the, the legend, legend the key. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is primarily agricultural land. There's also a couple of large prairies that are pounding for this. 
So we are not advocating for replacing, you know, cornfields and soy fields and prairies with trees. Um, we are tree huggers, but we try to be reasonable. Um, we, we still need the food. We still need all those other things. But there are ways to increase canopy in these areas, like along riparian corridors or as wind breaks or just where it makes sense. And so when we work in those counties, that's some of the messaging that we include is, you know, don't replace your crops, but maybe there's a place for trees in these areas. Um, otherwise, you see the, the pops of yellow, uh, more inner city in the high built areas. It's interesting. Is that, it looks like, <laughs> is that the area around Milwaukee that has many more trees than the area, than the urban area of Chicago? No, this is the boundary. Um, this is the, the northern part of Cook County, and then this is Lake County. So it's oh, like Lake Forest, okay. Wilmette, Lincolnshire, Riverwoods. They have, yeah, some of our highest canopy covers. Okay. And uh, since I've already got this up here, I will say, uh, based on our 2010 data, so we're getting 2020 data soon for what the canopy cover is now, but in 2010, the range of canopy cover went from something like 65% at the high end to I think 3% at the low end. So across our region, there's a lot of variation. It is not evenly spread out. It is not equitably spread out. Okay. Um, Brent wants to know, is there an easy, fast, inexpensive way to feed your trees? The best way to feed a tree? Um, and no. <laughs> so really, um, trees live on a, a long, slow s schedule. Um, the best way, and I hesitate to use the word feed because really they're feeding on sunlight. So, you know, make sure it's got the amount of sunlight it needs if you're feeding the tree. But in terms of just providing, you know, the nutrients it needs, maybe the best way is just putting down mulch, planting those native perennials around the base. Um, it won't be fast, you know, if you, if you get like a fertilizer treatment for your trees, it'll give it a quick burst of nutrients and you'll see it look green quickly, but that's not, it's, because trees live on a, a very long time scale, they're pretty good about putting their own resources where they're needed most. So it could be that your tree is growing slowly or it doesn't look like it's doing that great, but it's, it's prioritizing growing its roots you know, so that it can have long-term stability. And so when you put down something like fertilizer, it might force the tree to, to put more chlorophyll in the leaves or something, but that's taking away from its um, energy and carbon stores going in different places. So I'm typically not a person to recommend things like fertilizer just because it's not what the tree needs most often. If you're worried about your tree, um, definitely call a plant clinic because they might have specific ideas for your situation, but also it could be a matter of getting a soil test. Maybe there's low nutrients in your soil already, and then you can just um, put down mulch that'll again bring in those organisms, the microorganisms that you need um, to improve the health of the soil. Um, but mulch, adding plants, those are usually your best bets. And also just watering it uh, more regularly and soil tests. Is there a different kind of mulch that bring out different kind of nutrition for certain trees? Um, I've heard it said that it's best if you, like under conifers to use like a pine mulch, um, under hardwood trees using a hardwood mulch, under more of the perennials or shrubs using a leaf mulch. Um, there is a difference in the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the leaves. So like in the forest, the trees will fall straight down and that's usually exactly the carbon to nitrogen ratio those trees need. So their only leaves breaking down is like the best version of what they could get. Um, but I don't know that it's so specific that it's gonna make a difference if you're getting, you know, shredded wood or leaves from a different tree. <clears throat> um, all of it will be healthy. So I'm trying to think. Just, I would aim for just <clears throat> untreated wood. Um, if it's triple shredded or triple ground, it's gonna break down faster. So that might be a way to improve soil that's in rough shape, but that means you're gonna have to put down mulch every year. So if you go for double ground or something like that, it'll last longer. So it really depends on what your situation is and what your needs are. I wouldn't say there's a specific 
Like you don't have to put oak mulch on oak trees. You don't have to, you know, it's not that specific. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any more questions? So actually, I have one more. This one's a lot more complicated. So um, in the south side, we know they don't have enough trees, and they have a lot of abandoned houses and empty lots. And um, so there are some, I think, government people who would want to tear down the abandoned houses, but then for the... Uh, black uh, house, no, black people who want to own houses, they want to keep uh, the ownership high. So how do you find a balance between having a part in every five block that with trees versus higher rate of ownership in houses? Um, so just make sure I'm understanding the question. So it's about um, balancing maybe taking down some of those houses to put small parks or trees in or um, you know in a lot of those neighborhoods there's room for trees just in parkways and backyards so we don't have to be too invasive to do it also I think a lot of um, the vacant lot auction programs required to live in the area now so that it's reinvesting in the community and an opportunity for people to become homeowners and landowners, um, which you know we definitely support. <clears throat> uh, in terms of keeping that balance though, when we go to any community, especially the ones that we consider high priority, we try to spend a lot of time listening to what the residents in those areas want and what their needs are, what their values are. So we would never go into an area and say, you know, your canopy covers 10%, we're gonna get up to 20% and you're gonna love it, it's gonna be great because they have no reason to trust us. They have no reason to wanna to work with us. And very likely their priorities aren't about getting more trees. You know, they might have issues with crime or um, uh, maybe they are concerned about employment rates or things like that. And so we would go in more and talk about, well, here's some opportunities, here's some our partners doing work that might match up better with what you need. And we try to connect resources to the values of the people where we're trying to get work done. So it's a longer, slower process, but it's a lot more about building those relationships um, and making sure that we're not being extractive or invasive, you know, any of that. Thank you. Uh, Brent on the chat again wants to know, uh, how much should you water a large tree? How many um, thousands of gallons a day should you <laughs> Just keep the hose running. No, <laughs> just don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, that's a site by site question. So for the first couple of years, it's usually like 10 to 15 gallons a week during the growing season. But once you get out of those first couple of years, it'll be a balance of keeping an eye on the weather. You know, if it's been wet for a couple of weeks, you don't have to water your tree, but if it hasn't rained in a month, your tree's probably struggling, even if it is a big tree. One of the things I recommend is digging a few inches down. And if it's dry a few inches down, your tree needs water. If it's moist a couple inches down, you're probably okay. Um, and so, yeah, you have to get muddy once a week or once every two weeks or something, but just a, a good rule of thumb. You're saying, but don't dig the roots of the of the tree just dig somewhere else right that's right um yeah i guess the first time or two you might accidentally hit a root if you're far enough away from the tree you're not going to hit anything structural so don't use like a big shovel two feet away from the trunk but maybe a hand trowel um and six to eight feet away if your tree's pretty big you know you could probably even go 10 feet away because those roots they will grow as wide as they are able to grow if you have a big open yard they are probably in the entire yard they don't go very deep, so they'll be in the top 18 inches probably. So just as you're digging, uh, be aware of that. And the further it gets from the tree, the more they're 18 inches deep versus, um, you know, right at the surface. That reminds me of something that I had, I had, uh, had uh, heard, mm -hmm. which is that <clears throat> if you water a tree too often and you mm -hmm. provide it easy access to water, then it won't. Uh, dig its roots deeply 
it, uh, which will compromise its structural integrity and its ability to uh, survive uh, drought conditions. Yeah, great point. So they might not go too deep, but they won't grow very far either. You want your roots to grow basically like a wagon wheel. You want them going out wide, coming from different directions in the tree. So if you water too often, or if you water in the same spot every single time too, the roots will always grow right there. At least the fine roots will. So um, yeah, ideally every time you water it, maybe you put the hose in a different spot or um, pour your buckets in a different spot. Um, yeah, that's, that's all. All right. I'm really looking forward to pulling up this website and digging into some of these maps. Looks great. Excellent. Do we have questions from, uh, from anyone else? Um, All right. I, sorry, I Go do ahead. want to point out, since you are going to check out our website, we are getting a new website on April 20th. So um, everything will be much easier to find in a month. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's the product of us throwing spaghetti at the wall every time we had a new project. So um, if you want to wait a month, it might be easier. If you want to search now, we have tons of cool stuff up there. It's just harder to find. Great, great pointer. <laughs> well, I've, I've really had a delightful time. Um, I love, I love the, your content and uh, the way that the information is presented. Uh, during my day job, I do a lot of uh, data informatics. So this is, uh, this is cool. Thank you again. We hope to have you back um, after you get your 2020 data. Yeah, hopefully this summer. Yeah, let, <laughs> uh, let Bonnie know, keep in touch with us and um, <clears throat> maybe uh, maybe next next spring we can have you back and give us an update, maybe a, a comparison between 10, 2010 and 2020. I'm sure that that kind of thing will be done too. Yeah, that'd be a good. I'd be glad to do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for everyone tuning in. We've got, we've got other programs coming up this month. Check out our meetup uh, on meetup.com. Look for the Prairie State Humanists. We've got a luncheon and a book club and we may have other events that pop up. We've got our regular Science Sundays. So uh, try to keep you all engaged and happy. And if I don't see you before March 14th, have a great Pi Day, everybody. Mm -hmm.